All right, uh, welcome, and uh, and thank you for coming out and, and braving uh, the hottest day of the year, I hope. Um, so thank you especially to Zach Tuman and, and Bill Bratton. Um, they just bring tremendous uh, knowledge and experience um, to us today, and uh, we're very grateful to them. Um, it's just, a, to me, extraordinary how much uh, experience is, is represented at this table tonight. And I'm not going to be um, going on at any great length. Uh, I think they've probably been introduced too many times in their lives um, to want to hear it from me again. But uh, I'll just point out some of the, the highlights. In the case of Zach Tuman, this is somebody who's worked with the, the mayor of Boston on management and budget. He's worked with uh, the uh, district attorney, Elizabeth Holtzman, and many of you um, from New York um, will know well. Um, he also, uh, in addition to that, was with the New York State Organized Crime Task Force. Uh, he was the director of public safety for the New York City Public Schools. He was the executive director of the Financial Services Technology Consortium. Um, at the, the Kennedy School, he heads executive education. He's led 100 workshops and training. Um, so this is somebody, again, who just brings us uh, tremendous knowledge and expertise. And so, uh, so I want to welcome Zach. And, and also I want to, uh, to welcome Bill Bratton. And uh, here again, it's very hard to know uh, how to do that adequately. Um, if you think of it, uh, this is somebody, j just to look at his resume, uh, has done something extraordinary that nobody's done before in, in leading three of the largest police forces in this country. But not just like the, the titles on his resume, but the fact that he was extraordinarily uh, successful in each of these um, positions um, in a way that's now become legendary. And so uh, it's kind of amazing how many of us have heard of CompStat, right? Um, but all of us uh, benefited, benefit from that uh, in the way that we can walk the streets of New York and even walk through the parks of New York now at night. Um, thanks to his uh, his innovations. Not too thanks. late, though. Not too late. Not too late. <laughs> we'll try it out later. We'll if see how that there goes. are limits. Okay. I feel like if I was walking with you, it'd be okay, though. <laughs> yeah. You won't see me walking at certain times. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so the other thing uh, to mention, I think, is is of course uh, now uh, he's with Kroll, and so he's also bringing to us. Um, the knowledge and, and, um, and perspective of the private sector on some of these same issues that interest us, whether it's uh, international terrorism, uh, religious extremism. So he, he's bringing to us uh, different perspectives, extraordinary experience, uh, and great accomplishments. And so I just want to thank him again, and also Zach, Zach Tuman. Uh, for, for joining us this evening. So please welcome them. And I also want uh, to thank once again Roger Hertog uh, for making this possible and also to the History Department and to the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy for sponsoring this series. Uh, so please welcome them for me. So um, as I understand it, uh, Zach, you thought that, um, that, that you and Bill might uh, begin just laying out um, some of the things that uh, uh, inspired you to, to write this book together. And, uh, and then we might do an informal discussion. I'm happy to pose some of the first questions, and I know many of those here would, would like to ask questions as well. Um, so how would you like to begin? Sure. Would you like to? Uh, Bill and I uh, have had the opportunity. We've known each other for uh, many years. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work together professionally. Uh, and Bill has had a prominent role at the Kennedy School uh, in a number of extremely important moments for the school and, and for uh, policing. Bill was responsible, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, was part of an uh, effort to recreate American policing that um, uh, took hold there. Uh, it's called community policing. And um, <coughs> I've led programs in executive education and uh, development with uh, s senior executives in the industry of government on a variety of problems and had the opportunity to bring Bill up on, uh, on a couple of occasions. And uh, we were talking in one, one of the sessions about collaboration and I realized that we, it's really what we know a lot about now. Uh, and Bill has tremendous accomplishment in the field. Uh, uh, um, I've uh, had practice experience and also opportunity to sit with executives um, over the years. Uh, and as uh, although I was running the session, uh, my mind drifted and I began to realize that there is an opportunity with Bill uh, to write about some of the important lessons that we learned uh, to help others be effective um, and to share the stories of men and women that we knew um, and we had worked with uh, to help 
uh, reveal some of the ways that, uh, important ways that people could come together uh, collaborating. So I approached Bill over a lunch break. I said, uh, why don't we do a general management book about collaboration? And uh, Bill uh, said, tell me more. And uh, from there, we developed the, the concept. We developed the stories. I would focus on uh, Bill's efforts in Los Angeles and New York, but it would be broader than that. Uh, and so in the book, you'll see, I think, five sections in which uh, Bill's experience in New York and Los Angeles are highlighted and explicated, and then a number of other stories. So, Bill, you want to add to that? The uh, book that's being referenced, and uh, Matt has it down that end, uh, is actually the second book I've had the uh, privilege and opportunity to collaborate on. The first was a autobiography with uh, uh, Peter Nobler that was a recounting of my experience, particularly in policing during a time of extraordinary change, and that was during the period 1970 to 1996 when I had left as police commissioner. The book was published in 1998. This book, which was published in January, is a continuation for me uh, as far as my contribution, my stories in the book, of some of what happened in the NYPD in particular, but uh, my more recent experiences in the LAPD in Los Angeles over the period 2002 to 2009. The book is a book of stories. It's, it is a leadership management book, leadership in the sense that Zach and I deeply believe that issues of controversy, issues of change, issues of dynamics can be successfully addressed in public sector, private sector, uh, in the religious uh, sector, if you will, uh, through collaboration. And the idea of collaboration is certainly not new, um, but what we tried to do with the book was to uh, outline what we believe are a series of steps that, if taken, will significantly improve the likelihood of success for a collaborative effort. And there are eight steps that we've identified. So the, the heart of the book are those eight steps. And in the approximately two dozen stories that are told in the book, we attempt to relate those stories to the eight steps. The idea of collaboration always starts with uh, a leader, and a leader who has vision, whether it's Steve Jobs by himself as an individual. But if he did not begin to share his idea that uh, we wouldn't have Apple or might be the uh, three individuals who were involved with uh, uh, the creation of Google, who, if they kept it to themselves, would not have uh, the, the world of Google that we're so exposed to. Uh, Facebook, uh, I think it's within the next two years, three years, there'll be almost a billion people who will have friended each other in that uh, 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 world. And none of this could have occurred without uh, we believe the eight elements of uh, a successful collaboration we talk about in the book. And uh, we also talk about uh, some failures, including my own failure with Mayor Giuliani when I was police commissioner, that we had a successful collaboration for a period of time. But then ultimately, as far as uh, our relationship, there was a failure there that resulted in my leaving the position of police commissioner after two years. So the book uh, uh, that uh, brought us to this uh, uh, meeting that uh, 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 spawned the invitation is called Collaborate or Perish. Kind of a harsh term, or perish. But if you think of it that, uh, well, most of you in this room are a lot younger than I am, that uh, I look back to uh, companies and things that were going on back in the 1970s and that <coughs> Uh, Wang, Kodak, Polaroid, names that were very big uh, in innovation during my period of uh, coming into policing, uh, no longer exist. They fail to collaborate with their customers in a way that allowed them to survive. Kodak basically missed the digital uh, uh, revolution that was going on around it. If you think of it, uh, uh, Borders, Barnes & Noble, tremendous competitors with each other, the big box bookstores. Barnes & Noble still, still there, hanging on by its fingernails, but what allowed it to survive was Nook. Nook basically allowed it to reach an audience that increasingly wanted to read on an electronic device and not necessarily a hard, co hard cover book. 
Borders didn't have a similar way of networking or collaborating with its patrons. It's now out of business. Recently, uh, Miss Sony, one of the top uh, designers, high-end design, very expensive clothing, understood that to grow its revenues, to grow in size, there was a limit to how many rich people around the world were willing to pay the extraordinary prices for their clothes, or could even fit into them for that matter, that, uh, and opted to collaborate with Target. Target, a certainly middle-class, middle-of-the-road focus, and developed a line of clothing that uh, was so successful in its first day that the uh, website uh, crashed and you could not find a single piece of Masoni clothing in a Target store. It sold out that quickly. So a very successful collaboration. So that's the book in the sense of the emphasis that private sector, public sector, uh, personal life, uh, if you think of it, what's a marriage? A marriage is a collaboration where you agree to come together on a shared platform. Uh, both of you have a vision uh, uh, and are uh, leaders of what you want the future to be. And uh, so even in uh, the, the, the world of uh, personal relationships, uh, collaboration is, is an essential concept. Well, it's interesting you mentioned marriage because uh, it reminds me of what, one of what seemed to me one of the, the paradoxes of the book in that it's about collaboration, but most of the stories are about leadership, right? And so is it necessary to have you know, leadership in order to create um, fruitful collaboration? In a, in a marriage, anyway, it's often unclear who the leader might be, and that can change over time. So. I think leadership. Jacket off if you don't mind. As well. <laughs> I think leadership is essential. Um, uh, it's proven throughout each of the stories. Um, it's what stitches together a collaboration across a collaboration life cycle, mm -hmm. from visualization to um, configuration of the problem to uh, formation of the shared assets that people will contribute to. Um, mobilization of support uh, for the collaboration uh, to then realization of the effects, you know, the data sharing, for example, uh, and finally transformation to value from all of the assets that have been pooled together. It takes leadership to stitch that together. Bill's experience in New York with Comstead, I think, um, highlights that uh, very much. At the other, on the other hand, um, the final chapter is Arab Spring. Uh, Arab Spring had thousands of leaders. Um, there were no leaders, there were many leaders. Um, people led in different ways, um, st starting with the fruit seller in the square uh, in Tunisia. Um, <coughs> he wasn't the first to immolate, self-immolate, but he wasn't, uh, but it, it, it triggered the moment uh, of the day. Um, he led by his, his own example. It brought many people forward and triggered Finally, uh, um, a wave of, of, uh, of discontent and uprising that uh, brought um, hundreds of thousands of Egyptians together in Tahrir Square over a period of days and finally caused the government to fall. We've seen the, the effects now uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout the Middle East. Um, there was no leadership um, that, of the kind that, of the great man or great woman kind. Um, the great men, great women leaders who did arise fell to the wayside. Um, um, perhaps we're seeing the consequences of that now. Um, but does collaboration take leadership? Always. Is it, a, is it the great man, great woman? Sometimes. Um, increasingly now, the digital age permits leaders to arise in many different places for moments, for days, for months, um, um, singly or together with millions. Mm -hmm. I think it also requires, if you think of it, uh, identified leadership. Uh, currently what's going on in Egypt, uh, a significant part of the movement or uprising there uh, has found itself muted in the current uh, standoff between the uh, two factions, the military and the uh, other faction that uh, competed in the election, and that that other group, the group that did not have identified leaders, has in some respects lost its voice to the other two. Uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement that had so much momentum and spontaneity to it and celebrated that it didn't have leaders, 
I think its lack of identified leaders ultimately caused its significant reduction in impact size and, uh, and voice. That, so uh, you might be able to advance with a, a, an anonymous leadership or a group leadership, but my own feeling is that uh, it needs to coalesce into a, a Steve Jobs or a Google or a consortium of people who clearly are willing to uh, do what leaders do, which is uh, create change, uh, become the change. Gandhi had a wonderful expression to paraphrase, something to the effect that uh, to create change, you must become the change. And he was certainly uh, the living embodiment of the change that he was advocating, that trying to create a, uh, a free India and a, uh, an India that uh, could rule itself. And so in terms of leadership, it's, uh, I think that the network world today allows anybody to have their 15 minutes or allows anonymity to exert leadership. But unless it identifies itself and identifies itself in a way that can continue to inspire and attract others, it'll eventually dissipate mm -hmm. and, and, and the collaboration will uh, fail. Right. You, you describe collaboration as a, as a force for innovation, for efficiency. Um, but and for change, but uh, does a, a, is a more collaborative world going to necessarily be a better world? I mean, you could have written this book profiling, you know, leaders like Bin Laden, like Hitler, et cetera. I mean, people with blue sky visions, you know, but but no no world that we wanted to live in. Um, but you could have written this book where the collaborations are ones directed towards very different kinds of ends. I mean, is is collaboration itself value neutral? Oh, uh, uh, of course. Um, uh, collaboration is a is a, a, a technique, a technology. It's a it's a way of it's a way of mobilizing uh, folks from around the world or around the corner to come together and achieve some shared shared purpose. Mm -hmm. That purpose can can be dreadful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it can lead to uh, planes flying into the World Trade Center. Um, it can be noble uh, and uh, lead to much greater awareness of the, th the threats to, to nations from around the world um, or improved health for children uh, in, in places where we've never been able to reach before or um, uh, better education uh, for uh, children here in cities. So uh, yes, it's, I, I believe that it's, um, it's, a, it's a series of uh, capabilities um, that can be used for, for good and for bad. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, do you think of the topic that you've been looking at, the issue of religion, that um, in terms of Islam, the uh, Muslims, that the, in some respects the hijacking of uh, that religion by uh, Osama bin Laden and other terrorist type organizations for their own purposes and uh, that, that's certainly a, a negative, and they, they would argue that what they're doing is effectively trying to, uh, if you will, adhere to the tenets of that religion through their interpretation of it, which is certainly a, a minority view in the, in the world that has over <coughs> a billion other adherents who basically adhere to it because of its, its strengths and uh, its, its propagations of uh, purity and versus uh, what I'll use Al Qaeda is that's the one that we we tend to focus on mostly when we think of uh, terrorism and, and issues of is Islamic radicalism. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I think the, the the gist of the book is um, that um, everyone collaborates. Um, those who do it better prevail. Mm -hmm. You'd better get pretty good at it um, if you're going to market. If you're going to a battle space. If you're entering a political race. Um, you must be at the top of your game because those who you face there will be at the top of theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think that uh, this, is, this book shows the way uh, for people who want to be better at this uh, to make that move. Mm -hmm. Zach, you mentioned how you know, the concept of collaboration has so many paradoxes built into it. I mean, another one seems to be that you know, many people are happier in hierarchical organizations. Uh, or they, they seem to be, and I mean that's one of the recurrent stories of the book is is how hard it can be, you know, to get people out of their box and, and get them to to start innovating and working, 
you know, across the usual kind of bureaucratic boundaries. But um, I mean, more collaborative environments are inevitably more demanding, right, on particular individuals who are part of these organizations, aren't they? And, and some people will respond to those demands and, and thrive, and, and others just want to, you know, put in their hours and, and go home. Um, I mean, from a leader's point of view, that's, that's their tough luck. I mean, if you want to maximize efficiency and, and produce innovation, then yes, everybody has to be on board with it, whether they like it or not, or they can get off. But it, it is, you know, the kind of innovation that does appeal to a leader potentially more than and somebody who has to be led. We, we talk about in the book uh, along that theme that there uh, has to be something in it for everybody, for uh, the idea of leader, vision, finding a platform that people can go to. And in today's network world, it's, it, it's you know, depending on what your interest is, you can find the platform going on the, on the web. Uh, but for people to collaborate that uh, from diverse backgrounds, uh, motivations, there really has to be uh, some unifier that they find something in a cause, a movement for them. Uh, mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street ended up over time attracting a wide diversity of adherents into their camps. They were there people certainly who were jobless, there were other people there for other social causes and issues. and. But for a period of time, there was a platform where they could gather and where they could be visible for their respective issue. And over time, that began to dissipate. But uh, it really is uh, kind of an extension of uh, Jim Collins' uh, uh, book, uh, Good to Great, and the idea that uh, in managing change in an organization, any organization, public sector, private sector, something I adhere to, that uh, he has an expression about get the right people on the <coughs> bus, the wrong people off the bus, meaning those that don't share the vision, and get the right people in the right seats, which goes to, I think, the point of your question that uh, you know, some people want to be leaders and be risk takers. Others are very happy to go with the flow. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a big bus, a lot of seats on the bus. You want to sit in the front, you want to sit in the back, you want to open your window. Uh, but you're all still going in the same direction. That, uh, so one of the things about collaboration is to try to find a big enough platform that you can attract uh, more and more people despite their particular motivations, but you want them to come to the essential theme, if you will. Mm -hmm. In the case of the bus, they all want to get to the same destination. Mm -hmm. okay. um, hierarchies are good. Um, we have them for a reason. They, they um, they're, they can be efficient, they can scale, um, they can deliver a consi consistency, right? um, uh, but they can be constraining. Our colleague Steve Kelman has a book called Unleashing Change, and he characterizes uh, the readiness of change in organizations. Uh, with, uh, there's a large, there's some first movers always, some guys who are just chomping at the bit to go. Um, uh, but there's a larger group, sort of in the middle, which he calls the change vanguard. The change vanguard is standing ready, but they're watching. Um, they're dissatisfied with the status quo. They feel as though uh, everyone can do better. It's being able to work with those groups um, to unleash change. And I think the, um, it's worth taking a moment uh, for in, in, in Bill's leadership uh, in the New York Police Department um, to uh, to, uh, in that instance, um, cops uh, had been uh, had been uh, constrained for years um, from dealing with the kinds of disorder on the street that citizens really cared about. It was Bill's great insight that 10 percent of New Yorkers were victimized by crime, but 100 percent of New Yorkers bore witness to the disorder that was all around the squeegee men. Um, prostitution, street level disorder, gambling, graffiti, public urination. Those were the signs and signals that created a sense that there was a, that, that the city was out of, out of, uh, out of whack. The cops had been constrained for many years from dealing with them because there was great fear of corruption. Uh, the decades of the 60s and 70s had shackled cops from dealing with those, with those kinds of, uh, of matters. Um, Bill saw that there were eight strategies that 
uh, reform of New, York, of New York policing and creating a safer city and restoring the city um, could unleash. Um, and he, they were channels that he created. And he then began to activate cops through first with the command staff, um, getting them on board. That signaled to the middle man, to middle man, I'm taking your story. <laughs> Please feel free. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, that signaled to middle managers and it's finally good, to the good collaboration. And finally to the rank and file. That change was afoot. There was an opportunity to invent and be that change. Um, Bill describes it in the book as the effects of a, of a Christmas tree. Um, moving out to the branches and finally to the point of contact, bringing best practice. It mobilized the New York Police Department in really extraordinary ways uh, and changed the look and feel of policing on the street for a decade. Oh, that's it? Okay, we're okay. good. Okay. <laughs> um, so I know you get this question a lot, and so maybe you could, uh, uh, I'll let you take it any way you like, but, but uh, you mentioned earlier, Zach, with our students how it is that uh, you're often told, well, what about WikiLeaks? You know, isn't that an example of how you know, collaboration isn't always necessarily a good thing? Um, I mean, just putting, even if you want to put that example aside, I mean, can you imagine situations where actually less collaboration would be better? Um, I mean, is collaboration necessarily, you say it's a technology, is it, is it like a hammer where you need nails? I mean, or is it more like the, uh, the socket set where you can find any number of applications? Well, it's a, let me just take a quick stab sure. at that because it, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the U.S. Congress, which if they could collaborate better, uh, they might actually be an effective <laughs> body. Uh, and at the same time, if there were less collaboration among them, that maybe they wouldn't get into so much trouble. So I think it's, a, it's kind of a, it's, what's the expression, Dan, if you do, Dan, if you don't. Well, there are adversarial systems too, right? I mean, you don't necessarily want the plaintiffs and the defendants' attorneys to learn how to collaborate. Oh, no, but the idea is the collaboration around, in that case, mm -hmm. around the rule of law. Mm -hmm. The idea of they are certainly on uh, different uh, sides of an issue, but so you want, the, but you want them to collaborate around <coughs> the rule of law. That if you don't have it, uh, similarly. Uh, nations that cease to become nations, one of the first things that ceases is the ability to have contracts, the ability mm -hmm. to have a deal that can be enforced, if right. you will. And uh, so, uh, if, if anything, uh, uh, collaboration is essential, whether or not you're adversarial or uh, 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 in partnership. Mm -hmm. Well, certain kinds of collaboration we prohibit by law, right? Like cartels, for instance. I mean. There's, there are certain kinds of, like, for instance, the market that we want not to be, you know, we, we want to encourage, you know, competition. And so it's a collaboration around, you know, rules of law, for instance. But, I mean, there are many situations, aren't there, where actually collaboration would be a bad thing. Um, is WikiLeaks one of those situations, or is that just, you know, they didn't get, get it right? I mean, <clears throat> are there certain dom domains, like intelligence, for instance, where... Still uh, piping can be a good WikiLeaks thing. WikiLeaks had an extra, extraordinary effects around the world, yeah. um, for better and for worse. Um, um, uh, many, many people I know or feel as though it's, um, and it was a, a, uh, an epical moment in, in the ability of citizens to, to expose uh, the inner workings of government in a way that, uh, that was worthy. Uh, uh, I feel strongly that it wasn't. Um, and that that it was uh, an, uh, that it was a destructive uh, force um, in many ways, uh, and and the consequences for information sharing, as I mentioned in the class, within the United States government, as a result, uh, it it enabled those who had always argued against sharing information uh, to now uh, in, to now. Um, say I told you so, uh, and to pull back from uh, from what was a good, what was strong momentum for information sharing. And say we're not going to do it. Um, so it was now is is Julian Assange responsible for that effect in the United States government? No, but um, uh, is that the consequence of uh, of of WikiLeaks? Yes. Um, 
Uh, could he have anticipated that? No. Um, but was it a, was it a, I think, a, a net, net beneficial? Uh, um, I don't see it as a collaboration. I see it as, I see it as careful placement of, a strategic placement and management of news organizations for the release of confidential government information that's not his to release. Um, government is a duly elected an authorized body of men and women who are supposed to execute the political will of the people who put them in office <coughs> uh, within the rule of law. And um, um, my feeling is, is that uh, this, was, this was not a collaboration. This was a, this was a, a decisive move by an individual who felt uh, empowered and authorized to, to do something that, in, in my view, was, was wrong and inappropriate. But it was taking advantage of a collaborative platform, one that had been set up to try to um, reduce the stovepiping of intelligence, right? I mean, th that was the original source of the, of the leaks. Well, the, original, yeah. well the, the source of the leaks were, were uh, computer records that, um, that uh, he obtained uh, from uh, military personnel um, and that, uh, it, that um, uh, uh, and that he then worked hard to place with selected news organizations strategic leaking. Um, he didn't uh, just turn it all over. Uh, um, he was very careful about who got it, when, and how it was going to go out mm -hmm. uh, to maximize its effect, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, I think your point, or one of your points, though, was the idea that his ability to access so much information was because of a well-intended effort Mm -hmm. to deal with the effects of 9-11 where the stove piping was so dramatic that information was not being exchanged. Right. And one of the risks, and certainly I experienced this in policing and traditional crime fighting and certainly much more specifically in counterterrorism, where I'm a, a, a great believer or practitioner in the idea of inclusiveness, uh, you really have to advocate for me to exclude somebody from information sharing. Uh, I'm much more inclined to include them and the inclusion of cops uh, to a much greater degree in the planning and implementation of strategies in the 1990s helped to bring about the citywide impact in terms of reduction of crime, yeah. rather than the previous decades where cops really were excluded from participation in that development. And, uh, but the effort after 9-11 was to try to find ways to share information with more people. So in this case, you had a private first class, which is about as low a rank as you can get in the military, having access to this phenomenal amount of information and then attempting to do significant harm with the release of that information. That is one of the risks of collaboration, that uh, the idea of much more access to much more information, and particularly in certain environments such as counterterrorism or even business competitiveness. Uh, it, and also the willingness of countries, including our own, to really try to access and acquire as much information as humanly possible through any types of means or sources. It's, uh, it, it, it creates uh, uh, disincentives for collaboration on the part of many who recognize there's some risk to collaboration, significant risk. Right. So I could turn the discussion to you know some uh, cases uh, having to do specifically with uh, with policing. Um, so, you know, one um, area in which collaboration has has been considered particularly important is the way in which um, you know police learn to collaborate with the community. You know, in, in terms of understanding the nature of crime you know, and and, um, and establishing relationships, establishing trust, and. You know, many would say that development of community policing is one of the great success stories you know, of the last you know, 20 years or more, perhaps. Um, but in, in recent years, since 9-11, there's also been the, uh, you know, the, the drive towards uh, developing more effective counterterrorism um, programs, including police departments and counterterrorism. And so there's, for many, an apparent conflict that's grown up where community policing would appear to depend on uh, establishing trust with, uh, with the community. Um, and on the other hand, counterterrorism could include things like, like here in, in New York, um, an intelligence bureau, counterterrorism unit, which in some cases, yes, they need to collaborate with the community, but for the purposes of, of gathering information in ways that uh, community leaders not, might not always understand or, or accept. So is that the 
an example I, of yeah. I, I don't really see a contradiction yeah. between community policing. Actually, I think community policing, we benefited in, for the first time, local police, New York, LA, Chicago, Boston, having to deal with the issues of terrorism because prior to 9-11, Counterterrorism was largely, almost totally, the responsibility of the federal government, and very specifically several agencies within the federal government. Community policing uh, has as, at its most fundamental uh, bases uh, three elements, uh, the three Ps, if you will, to simplify it. Partnership, police, which had been an entity uh, when I came into the profession in 1970 that really kept its distance from the community, the thin blue line. The idea was, leave us alone, we'll take care of business, we'll try to keep you safe, but we know what's best. Leave it. And the LAPD was probably the poster boy model for that, former chief of uh, Bill Parker, who coined the line, thin blue line. Most people think that means, well, there's so few police. In the case of Los Angeles, it meant, leave us alone and we'll take care of business. Unfortunately, that business oftentimes was oppression of the city's minorities, particularly its black community, and the alienation of police in that community. There was certainly no partnership between the police and community. And where the partnership is so important is that policing <coughs> in the 70s and 80s uh, was going in the wrong direction in that leave us alone, we know best, but what police tended to focus on was the more significant crimes, the things that made the newspapers, the crimes that they had to report to the FBI twice a year for the National Uniform Crime Report. There's an expression, you can expect what you inspect. And so the expectation was you're gonna to have to uh, report crime to the FBI, so that's what you focused on. So in the 70s and 80s, police moved very much away from what they had traditionally done since their founding in the 1840s, the Metropolitan Police in London, where they were in the community, they were of the community, and they were very visible in the community, that's the blue uniforms and the high helmets and the copper buttons, that the role of police when they were formed was to prevent crime. Sherlock Holmes didn't come along until the 1870s, so basically the whole role of police when they were first created was by their presence to prevent crime. And the idea, one of the ways to do that was in partnership with the community because they were so close to the community, the community could let them all know every day, we want you to do something about this, we need you to do something about that. And what began to happen in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, it accelerated, police increasingly moved away from that prevention role and moved more toward measuring their success by response. So they lost a collaboration with the communities that they were attempting to serve, and in many respects went their own way. And in going their own way, they began to focus more significantly on just serious crime. It'd be like a doctor treating you, all he's gonna treat you for is the major illness, but there are many side effects of that illness, and he's not paying attention to them. Eventually, they're gonna kill you. And it may take a little while longer than uh, the catastrophic illness, but eventually it's gonna kill you. And that's what happened in our cities in the 70s and 80s, that as police stopped being in partnership with the community on priority setting, about dealing with the quality of life incidents on the streets that disturbed people every day, the aggressive beggars, the graffiti, the prostitution, the abandoned cars that never seemed to get moved, that one in 10 were victims of a serious crime, but every day the whole city was victimized by the quality of life crime. And police weren't paying attention to it because they were not partnering. They were not focused on problem solving, the second P of community policing. And they weren't focused on prevention, which was why they were created in the first place. In the 1990s, and New York is the most significant, because it's the biggest city, example of this, we embraced community policing partnership once again with the community, trying to work with the community, particularly communities that had become hostile to us, the <clears throat> minority communities in particular, and listening to what were their concerns. You know, we, do, we, we don't want to be accosted every time we drive into the city by the squeegee pest. We don't want to be accosted every time we go into the subway by somebody aggressively intimidating our tokens from us. And the idea was police once again return to a role of basic role of police is to prevent crime rather than measure our success by responding to it. And that's what happened with policing in the 90s. Now how does that not 
contradict the idea of counterterrorism. If you look at the various books and reports that have been written about the events of 9-11, central to every book that's ever been written about it is a criticism of the lack of coordination or collaboration. In some instances, required by law that the FBI could not talk with the CIA around issues of uh, terrorism. How foolish that now seems in hindsight, but that was the law. Well, the idea of counterterrorism to be effective requires partnership, certainly among all the agencies that are gathering intelligence and trying to act on it. It requires, after 9-11, partnership with local police, who they never had to interact with before. And believe me, it took us a couple of years to really force our way into the room, into the meetings with the feds to say, in this new era of terrorism, local police have to be involved because the homegrown terrorist is going to be much more a factor than the external terrorist. And that's effectively where we are in our country at this moment. Three quarters of the efforts that have been uh, attempted over the last 10 years were homegrown. They didn't come from outside the country. They were grown here. And three quarters of the detection of those incidents was done by local police working with information from local people. So the collaboration after 9-11 had to be significantly expanded because 20 or 30,000 federal agents could not deal with the new threat. But 800,000 police and 300 million Americans could effectively do that. And the collaboration is not without risk. The, the, the idea that the cost of battling between the NYPD and the FBI over who's leaking what secrets that uh, uh, spoil what investigations. But think of terrorism. It's partnership. It's problem solving. How do you identify with all these strands of information where there's likely to be an attack? And why do you want that? So you can prevent it. So I would argue that we benefited in 21st century by finally in the 20th century finding a successful philosophy of collaboration that could provide a foundation for the necessary collaboration that's going to be necessary in the 21st century. I mean, but surely that partnership with uh, community leaders, especially, you know, say they're leaders of the Muslim community, is going to be complicated. Oh, it's, when, it's extraordinarily yeah. complicated that uh, uh, in Los Angeles, for example, our chief of police there seeking to create a very strong counterterrorism operation there because L.A., like New York, not to the same scale, but is clearly based on all the information that we dealt with and some of the efforts that were made, was a, uh, one of the most likely terrorism targets in the United States. And so we needed a strong counterterrorism operation. But we also needed to much better understand the communities that we're going to have to interact with. Traditionally, when we tend to think of terrorism, we tend to think of, uh, uh, particularly in large cities like Los Angeles and uh, New York, the Jewish community being the subject of a lot of the terrorist attacks that had occurred in the past. In this new era, that a community that's very likely subject to that type of attack and retaliation uh, uh, initiated against it is the Muslim community that the idea of <coughs> the feelings of anger directed toward that community because of the uh, religion and the religious basis of the 9-11 assault. And I remember in uh, Los Angeles, we were making a very concerted effort to reach out to the Muslim community, very similar to what we were doing with the totally alienated African-American community and the at-risk Latino community that with their large immigrant population were very fearful of the police because most of them were coming from countries where they had good reason to fear the police. So we were reaching out and making very significant inroads trying to learn who is the Muslim community. It's not this monolithic entity. That, that it, it's, it's a faith that has many different factions to it. Clearly you see that in Iraq and other places where the internal civil war, if you will, is based around the issue of which faction or which, which branch of the religion are you a part of. But we had very little understanding of the Muslim community, Muslim faith uh, in policing, because they tend to be an extraordinarily law-abiding community. But our interaction with them was, by and large, minimalist, not too much criminal activity other than when they were victimized. And uh, really, certainly not an understanding of the faith itself and the various uh, uh, elements of faith within the group. So we began an effort to uh, try to understand that community. And similar to what we had done with the Jewish community for years, 
We attempted to identify where were houses of worship, where were schools, nursery schools. Where was that population? Where did it live? In Los Angeles, it was a very diverse community. There was not concentrations of tens of thousands in one area that you could identify. That's a Muslim neighborhood. They had, in the previous 30 years, uh, 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 basically assimilated very significantly into this very large county. And oftentimes, because of the newness, that they did not have identifiable mosques, if you will, like churches with spires and couplers. Oftentimes, they were still in storefront environments. They were still in environments that were not re readily recognizable. So we began what unfortunately was called uh, a mapping exercise. And uh, we worked with leadership that we've been engaged with in the Muslim community. And they uh, uh, responded that understanding what our purpose was and the idea being that if there were to be a significant attack and it was identified that it was a Muslim radical group responsible for it, there might be retaliatory efforts directed against Muslim places of worship and schools. And we needed to know that so that we, the police, could effectively secure those areas. Very much what we do with uh, Jewish communities of others. And we began the process, and uh, somewhere along the line, other groups within that very large, diverse Muslim community took offense to the idea of being mapped. The idea that we were profiling, because mapping had, was synonymous with profile. So a very well-intended effort really became a source of extraordinary national controversy where one faction in the community felt threatened by this activity that another faction, another leadership faction, had felt was a good thing for the community. So there was a failed collaboration in the sense that we did not get enough people onto the platform. But it also the idea of uh, how uh, even the most well-intended of activities can be really interpreted in so many different ways. And in that case, that uh, it caused a significant period of dissension, unfortunately, between the uh, police and some elements of the Muslim community in Los Angeles. Fortunately, I think we got over it, much the same as we were getting over 50 years of warfare with the African American community and began to come together. But uh, once again, it, it had to do with finding a way to collaborate. Okay, thanks. Um, before I open it up to questions from the floor, can I just ask about, you know, here in New York, uh, the recent controversy over the NYPD um, uh, monitoring of, of local mosques and, and also their surveillance of, of Muslim students. Do you have an opinion about that program? Actually, it's been very much reported on. I think the department has clearly stated its position. I think civil libertarians and many members of the Muslim community have expressed their concerns about the efforts. Uh, I think at this juncture, if I understand it, and I don't profess to be intimate with it, that uh, the department's position still remains that their activities are lawful, that uh, fall within their uh, uh, mandate, if you will, and uh, that the debate continues, but the debate is at least occurring, unfortunately, in, in, in our world, our democracy, in a very open way. And there are phenomenal different sets of opinions about um, the activities, whether they're, even if they're lawful, if they're appropriate. And I think some of it's coming down to that issue of appropriateness versus lawfulness. And uh, it's, to the best of my understanding, it's still not a, a resolved issue in the sense the department is still continuing its activities and there are still those that are objecting to them. Where would you come down on whether it's uh, appropriate or whether it's effective as policing? The appropriateness is based entirely on the information you're working with, information that then is made into <coughs> intelligence and not being privy to the information that would form the basis for directing your resources as to where they go. Uh, really can't comment on having headed up the LAPD and created a very significant counterterrorism operation there, actually comparable in size to the NYPD. I had 300 officers, they have 1,000, but my department was 10,000, it's 35,000 here. Having the intimacies with a lot of the information and intelligence that came into that unit that could not be shared with the public that resulted in us directing our activities in certain directions. 
Um, I, I, there's no way I can comment on the NYPD's assignment of resources because I have no access to the intelligence that they're basing their assignment re decisions on. Okay. All right. Thank you. So let me open it up to the floor. And I, I'm going to ask you to go to the microphone because we are uh, recording this for folks who are watching on the web. Um, so that's, they won't hear your question if, if you don't go to the microphone. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm Alice McGree, and I'm a former U.S. Department of State Foreign Service and Resident Is that microphone on? I, uh, I am speaking up. Is it on? Cree. Uh, able technician is hurrying over. I've been doing these types of seminars for 30 <laughs> years, and I don't think I've ever done one where these microphones, anybody can ever figure out how the hell they turn on. That you think in this day and age would have a simple switch on, off, and you can never find them. Nick, can you see if we can get some help with the mic? Yes. Maybe somebody outside on. Okay. Oh, it is. Okay. Can I start over? No, go, go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. So again, I'm, I'm Alice Labrie, and I'm former uh, U.S. Department of State Foreign Service, and I'm a resident of Harlem. I, I use that preface. I'd like to ask the both of you um, your opinions. Are leaders made or born? Uh, who, who made or born? Leaders. Are they made or are they born leaders? Uh, I think, speaking for myself, I think both. That. Uh, uh, I've attended any number of leadership courses, uh, uh, read any number of books on leadership, and uh, I, I, I think the majority are, in <coughs> fact, uh, born, if you will, shaped by uh, experiences into becoming leaders. Is it something that you can acquire leadership skills? Certainly, uh, a lot of people trying to sell books that uh, basically teach that, but. Uh, I, I, I know in my own experience that I think uh, I, I think of myself as a leader going back to uh, my childhood days. My sister had a nickname for me, Captain Billy Bones, because I was always in charge of uh, when we were playing or fighting. And uh, back in those days, I weighed uh, a lot less than I weigh today, so thus I was Captain Billy Bones. But uh, I think certainly uh, we try to create leaders by training them. That's, we certainly do that at our military academies. That, that's all about the idea of training leaders. And uh, so I think it can be a quiet, uh, but I think the majority of leaders, you have to want to be one. You really have to want to take risks and for whatever reason why people take risks. I, I know I've always been comfortable doing it. And a lot of my, I think some of it also has to do with motivation. A lot of my motivation to get ahead of policing, when I came into policing in the 1970s, the police profession was so brutal, so corrupt, so racist, uh, and the incompetency of the leadership of the organization I was part of, I just wanted to uh, work like crazy to get ahead of them so they'd be under me rather than over me. And fortunately, I succeeded. That, uh, within 10 years, they were all under me, and I was on top of them and was able to start creating the changes I thought were appropriate. I think leadership comes in many shapes and sizes. Um, uh, and different uh, people are uh, prone to it. They have personalities. They enjoy it. Um, others can be brought along. Um, they may not, may not realize that they are the right person to be that that kind of uh, uh, to, to be a leader. Um, uh, are they born? Are people born uh, to be leaders? Uh, many who may be born never are. Um, uh, many who um, uh, who are not born to be leaders can be brought along. So I think it's uh, there's a, a balancing between uh, uh, by example, by training, by proclivity, some mix, um, w and uh, whether one's successful or, successful or not um, has as much to do with the, the turns of fortune um, as um, whether you're born to it or whether you're trained well for it. One of uh my favorite quotes, and I love quotes, quotations, 
uh, as a young boy, sending a movie with my uh, dad, I probably was only about eight or nine years old, James Cagney was starring in it. It was called The Gallant Hours. And it was a depiction of uh, Admiral Bill Halsey, a very significant naval hero in World War II around the Battle of Guadalcanal. I'm currently reading a, a book about four admirals who were working with him in uh, World War II. But at the end of that movie, uh, Robert Montgomery was the narrator uh, of certain portions of the movie. There was a quotation that was applicable to Bill Halsey, whose World War II experiences had just been depicted. And it's something to the effect, uh, there are no great men. There are only ordinary men who, in response to uh, uh, extraordinary challenges, do great things. So the idea that they rise to the occasion, and they may be Oscar Miltos for most of their lives, and then something happens. And I just had the opportunity uh, a couple of weeks ago at the 92nd Street Y, uh, uh, the uh, Sully Sullenberger, the uh, uh, pilot that landed his plane in the Hudson River when they stalked the flock of birds. And Sully talked about that for 25 to 30 years, he was a captain on his airplanes in the military, lived a, a good life, but never thought of himself particularly as a leader. And then in that moment of 209 seconds, from the time the birds hit the plane to the time he landed the plane in the Hudson River, that's when he basically uh, uh, rose to that extraordinary occasion. So they can be uh, uh, created over time, like a military academy. It can be done, I think, uh, my own experience, something I always felt of my, thought of myself as a leader and always sought positions where I could be in a leadership role. Or it can, in a moment of spontaneity, that uh, the acts of heroism or, or uh, the spontaneity that uh, lead to great things happening. Hi, Jason Olson. I'm a, a PhD student in Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. And uh, I, I'm really interested in this issue that was, was kind of subtly brought up uh, between security versus liberty. And, uh, and, and then, and then um, on, on, the, on the other side, preventative crime uh, versus uh, rapid response to crimes that have already been committed. And as, as you've kind of brought up that um, terrorism pre prevent, presents uh, a unique case because the goal of terrorism is mass civilian casualties. Uh, and, and sometimes included that is, is the suicide of the, uh, of the attacker. So it's, it's, very, it's very detrimental to, uh, as, you, as you subtly mentioned, to respond to, to a terrorist attack uh, after it's already been committed. It's very important to prevent those attacks because the goal is massive civilian casualties. So I'm wondering where you, you, you both see the lines um, between security and liberty, particularly in our constitutional system. Thank you. A very good question. The uh, reality in a democracy, a democracy, and we're all fortunate that we live in one, is really where we agree to give up certain liberties, inalienable rights, for the idea of the common good. And in a democracy, uh, or a constitutional form of government such as we have, the role of the police is they are the entity and other law enforcement related organizations who are entrusted with the extraordinary powers to ensure that everybody adheres to the commonly uh, agreed to limitations on their liberty. And the challenge and the responsibility of the police is to continually do it constitutionally, can't break the law to enforce it, compassionately, that you're dealing with human beings and no matter how heinous the crime or how bad that human being is, there's still a degree of uh, uh, responsibility to uh, deal with that person as a human being within the tenets of the law. And lastly, the idea of consistently, that to not police the rich different from the poor, to police the black different than the white, that there has to be a consistency, a fairness, if you will. And policing uh, of necessity, the goal must be prevention. Nobody in this room would prefer to be the victim of a crime and have you uh, basically then have your uh, assailant arrested after the fact. You much prefer it never to have been assaulted in the first place. At the same time, we can never, in a world, we live in a world with human beings, there's always going to be crime. 
the best we can hope to do is reduce it to its lowest possible level. And so the focus of police that we failed at in the 70s and 80s on its emphasis on response to crime, 911, rapid response. Uh, we took the cops out of the neighborhood walking beats and put them in the cars. Why? So they could cover a larger area, but respond to crime when it occurred much more quickly. Losing sight of the fact by having the police officer in the neighborhood in the first place, he prevented a lot of that crime, that when he was put in his car and moved out, crime came in. Same for terrorism. Terrorism, uh, the reason we have all these fusion centers and the tension between how much information we gather and how much of it we use in terms of making intelligence, that's a fundamental tension in the issue of terrorism. Uh, the whole debate around uh, drone strikes that's currently uh, you know, on, on the front <coughs> pages of the paper. Does the president have literally the authority to authorize a drone strikes 16,000 miles away that's going to take the lives of uh, suspected terrorists. So there's a, there's a tension that's always going to be there, and that's why it's very important to have that tension discussed and known about and debated so that it doesn't become tyranny replacing basically uh, the terrorism that it's attempting to, to prevent. Um, we're at a point in the conversation here in New York in particular where um, uh, a point which, speaking for myself, makes me uncomfortable because we're being asked to choose between security and liberty, it feels to me, um, when I believe that those are consistent and possible to attain both. I look into the book for an example from another domain, and I see the example of uh, a large manufacturer, in this case Alcoa, uh, led by a man named Paul O'Neill. Uh, and Alcoa um, was an aluminum giant with fabulously difficult work environments, very dangerous, smelters, mines, a lot of injury. O'Neill came in and said, look, um, we are going to become the safest workplace in the world. It's a value that I believe um, is non-debatable. It is non-debatable. And um, uh, I believe also that by understanding our work process to become the safest company in the world, we will also understand then that same root process to learn how to become the most profitable company in the world. And he said that the trade-off between profitability and safety is a false one, um, that you can have both. It takes a lot of work. Um, but by understanding in the, in, the manufa in the manufacturing world how to achieve the processes that would yield safety, you could also understand the processes that could achieve um, a profitability. I believe that we can have security and liberty, that we don't have to trade them off, that um, constitutional policing is our goal. Um, uh, when we look to the blitz of London and the counsel to, to Churchill to close museums and movie theaters, uh, Churchill said, that's the reason we fight to keep them open. And they stayed open. Um, it's important uh, that we have the conversation that Bill has suggested um, and, and speak wisely of it. Uh, we're at a point where we're seeing, I think, a quick move for ends justifying means, um, too quick for the debate that we need around um, these very important efforts because they are critical um, and they are critical to, to, to do well. Hi, I had a question uh, that to do with the uh, community policing and the counterinsurgency that uh, tactics that have adopted <coughs> community, community policing ideas. I was wondering how effective you thought it had been um, or do you think Counterinsurgents could have been more effective, or less effective, if they incorporated more community policing ideas. And additionally, in the U.S., we have a very strong delineation between the use of the military uh, in domestic affairs and policing uh, for civilian affairs, which isn't as much uh, delineated in other countries. Uh, well, I was wondering what you thought about the use of these tactics by the military or the police in trouble spots. 
Afghanistan? On my end, I, I really have no uh, formal training or exposure to counterinsurgency, which is practiced by the military, basically. Uh, but with my awareness and limited knowledge of it, it has many similarities to community policing. It's the, uh, the, the old adage about winning the hearts and minds of the people. The idea that why we're there is to try to uh, secure the benefits of democracy, if you will, and that's what community policing is all about, the idea of to be able to live in a neighborhood and to be free from harassment and free from fear. And that's effectively, uh, if I understand uh, the military version of it, that's what it intends to do, to try to, as much as possible, encourage collaboration with, in our case, uh, military <coughs> forces in whether it's Afghanistan or wherever, to try and reduce the fear and the, and the terrorism. So uh, the military has sought uh, significantly over the last 15, 20 years since the advent of community policing to spend a lot of time trying to learn from the public police sector. When I was in Los Angeles as chief of police there, we had continual groups of military officers coming through before being assigned to Iraq and Afghanistan to try to understand democratic policing and the whole idea of community policing. And similarly, uh, in New York City, when we developed CompStat, interestingly enough, in the 1990s, military, the uh, Army General Staff, actually the Joint Chiefs of Staff sent a delegation to the NYPD to learn about CompStat. What was it? What, what, what was it? Why was it so successful? And one of the reasons why CompStat was so successful was it was, in some respects, a counterinsurgency operation working in the neighborhoods of New York trying to take back those communities that have been taken over by the criminals, if you will. So there's a, a correlation, uh, I believe, between the two, but I'm, I'm also with the caveat that I've never <coughs> formally trained or been exposed to counterinsurgency. I just have, a, I think, more of a layman's awareness of it. I would say the, um, uh, in the book, we, we, we quote a, a good friend of ours, Phil Hyman, who's a professor at law school, is also, Harvard Law School, has also written a wonderful book on public management. Assistant Attorney General. Uh, former Assistant Attorney General under, under uh, the Civil Rights uh, uh, Criminal Division, I believe. Is it criminal? Yeah, crim criminal yeah. Division. Um, and Phil s speaks of, uh, of collaboration as, as, as always involving some power, some sharing of power. And um, in and, and community policing, that sharing, and, and it's very difficult for um, men and women who are used to being to living in command and control worlds uh, where they have, uh, they're, be, they're told what to do and then they like to tell other people what to do. It's very difficult then at the, at the, in, in the environment of community policing to share power. What does it mean to share power? It means, it means sharing the agenda for what police should be paying attention to. I think that's one of the, one of the tremendous innovations of community policing was uh, the move away from a police defined a def an agenda defined only by police to an agenda defined in collaboration with a community. They were quite different agendas, as Bill, as we write about, as Bill has spoken of also. It's that power sharing, though, which really opens the door. Uh, it doesn't mean that you give up your, your authority as a cop. It means you loan your authority for a different set of purposes. It doesn't mean that you, that you expect uh, citizens to go out and make arrests or to be crime fighters. As Bill has noted, when people come home at night at 6 o'clock, they don't want to go out and fight crime. They want cops. That's what cops are for, right? Um, they want peace, and, peace on the stoop, quiet night with television, dinner to bed, uh, or, or, or a lively night, uh, as you might wish. He lives in a lively neighborhood. <laughs> I, live in, I live in a very lively neighborhood. I live in Washington Heights. Um, uh, but it's that power sharing, I think, which is at the, which is at the heart of both what's difficult and important, whether in counterinsurgency operations and building hearts and minds relationships, or in community policing, it's difficult, and it really takes leadership in many, many ways all around. So. Uh, this is a question for Bill Bren. Uh, you talked about how 
um, when you went to LA, one of the things you did was try to uh, reach out to the African American community, which had been marginalized by the LAPD. And I'm wondering what techniques and, and what strategies did you use um, with the LAPD to get that rapport back between the community, the African American community, and the LAPD? It was really the idea of reconnecting with a community that had uh, become totally alienated from the police, and the police had become totally alienated from, the, uh, from them. And it was really the idea of, of going to that community. I don't, before I went in, before I go into any police assignment, I always do uh, my homework, if you will. And in Los Angeles, the idea of identifying who are the key players in the various communities, both political activist leaders, uh, those that support, those that are against. And uh, you start with the leadership of the various communities. And the Christmas tree effect that Zach talks about, you start working your way down the Christmas tree where you start reaching larger bodies of people. I spent a lot of time in church basements, in living rooms, school auditoriums, in good times and in bad. And the secret, aspect, the, the, the secret of it is to spend more time there in good times. So when something does happen, you've built up at least a reservoir of recognition that this isn't the first time you've been down there, that you were there in the, in, in the quiet times. And uh, it resonates. And then it's the idea of, uh, as a leader, uh, surrounding yourself with other like-minded uh, people. And so in my case, that would be the 100 members of the Los Angeles Police Department Command Staff, who in the seven years I was there, each and every one of them was appointed by me, promoted by me, and assigned by me. So I was able to, the Jim Collins analogy, get the right people on the bus, and then I could get them in the right seats. But to a person, they were committed to restoring the reputation of the LAPD and its re relationship with that minority community. And we were so successful in that regard in that when I left after seven years, the three African-American newspapers uh, were all very complimentary of that period of time in terms of the positive changes that have been made. I can quite honestly uh, say to you that I don't think there was a single significant black political leader, uh, civic leader, community leader that was uh, openly hostile to the department. And that was not the case when I got there, because they all were, from Maxine Waters on down to some of the local uh, 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 black Muslim leaders. and. Uh, so that had changed. And the LA Times editorialized that uh, a corner had finally been turned on the issue of race relations in LA. Hadn't got, we turned the corner. It's not, it's no, where, where we are is not where, where we want to be, but where we are is a lot better than where we were. So it really uh, is a combination of leadership, collaboration, getting more people on the platform. And another example of uh, how it had changed when I was selected as police commissioner, a police chief, uh, the controversy around a white police chief coming into that department, the African American community was enraged by it because I was replacing a black chief who had replaced a black chief. And they, that community felt it had finally gotten possession of the leadership of the department and saw a white coming in as a regression back to the bad old days. And uh, ultimately, I ended up being more successful than my two black predecessors in that position. And the uh, ultimate sign of success was that when time came to select my successor, that the three final candidates were all white males. And the African American community expressed no opposition to that because they knew each of those three white males because they had seen them so often in their community and knew them. And uh, it's the idea of uh, collaboration allows you to know people and, and understand them and appreciate them. So it's uh, still a significant work in progress, that, uh, but compared to what it was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, it's come a long way. Thank you for the talk. Uh, and I think you course. two may be the last two questions. We get, we're getting pretty close to the witching hour, 7.30. Right. 
Yeah, uh, of course, within an organization with common pursuit of a goal, uh, collaboration makes an intuitive sense to me. But I guess for me, the bigger question is how do you quantify, or how do you measure the success of any project of collaboration? I'd like to give two examples. I mean, even in marketplace, let's say now we can say that Kodak failed to sort of collaborate within its stakeholders and all. But if you just go back in time, it seems arbitrary. If we were having this conversation, let's say 1990, we'd give Kodak as an exemplary example of how a company should run itself. But then over time, we tend to realize that we tend to either overestimate or underestimate and fail to predict the future outcomes. So that's one example in marketplace. But if you look at any projects of social engineering, and it is very difficult to establish any causation saying this is the consequence of a certain policy, a certain plan. So you, you guys give an example of Arab Spring. But of course, right now, it would be easier for us to pinpoint one vendor saying he burned himself, and that triggered the entire process. But in, I guess the truth is that people have been organizing against oppressive regime for 40, 50 years. And the whole emergent properties of complex systems, how do you really sort of wrap your head around the epistemological challenge of establishing success? I, I would answer uh, your, your question, if I understand it correctly, with the idea of uh, um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point, the, the idea that the individual who basically uh, burned himself to death uh, was the tipping point, that it, it reached a point where, uh, like an epidemic, it builds to a momentum where all of a sudden it explodes, it exposes itself. AIDS, AIDS was around for a decade before it was finally recognized that we had an epidemic. And it tipped, and then we began to pay attention to it, and unfortunately began to come up with some resolution, if you will. But uh, Gladwell, in his writing about tipping points, it's Kodak was in ascendancy for most of its history. It dominated the film industry. But when the digital revolution came in, it didn't go with it, and its fortunes tipped. As much as it had succeeded, it didn't take long for it to, to, to basically lose momentum. Gladwell, the inspiration for his book, interestingly enough, was uh, the subway, New York City subways. That he did an article in the New Yorker magazine in uh, the 1990s on this thesis he was developing, and he used by way of example in the article, and then subsequently in his book he expanded it to the city as a whole, but in the article it was referencing how bad the disorder and fear evasion problem was in the subway. It just kept increasing exponentially. Three and a half million people voted every day, and every day 300,000 people didn't pay the fare. And that number was increasing because there was no control over all this, this increasing disorder. When I came in as chief of the transit police in 1990, we began to find a way to go after the fare evaders, to be able to arrest them arrest them in a very visible way so it deterred others from evading the fair. And the largest fear of the public who were paying the fair applauded that finally <coughs> government and the police are doing something about not a serious crime, at that time a dollar fifteen that <coughs> service. But if you're paying your dollar fifteen, you resent that the person coming through the turnstile with you is not. And the tipping point was that as fast as that epidemic was increasing, once we found a cure, if you will, which in the early stages was arrest. That problem faded very significantly. And part of it was the uncertainty of arrest. If you were going to try to beat the fare going in the subway, you never knew if that guy lying on the bench was at an undercover cop with his eye on you. And as recently as uh, uh, two weeks ago, they arrested a couple of kids not paying the fare stopped them and they're carrying, uh, one, one had a machine gun and the other had a, a pistol on them. That, uh, so, so for not paying the $2 that, uh, fare, they ended up arrested. So tipping point is a, a, an element to address, I think, the issue you raised, if I understood the question uh, correctly, or uh, one explanation of it. There's a story in the book told uh, about a man named Steve Ellis uh, at Wells Fargo. And um, it's, a, it's a story about the value <laughs> of collaboration over a long period of time with customers um, and Steve was responsible for moving the commercial side of Wells Fargo from a brick and mortar banks online. Uh, and um, uh, his initial designs, he 
create a small, fast-moving, agile team of developers and web guys, and they moved out of Wells uh, to a hipster neighborhood in San Francisco. They were all looking at Silicon Valley and liking the startup, so they created themselves as a startup. And it, as they rolled the initial version of the commercial electronic portal out, uh, they had to design it themselves because their customers really didn't have a sense of what they wanted or what they could do. But Steve began then to uh, bring the uh, electronic portal to wave after wave of customers, thousands and thousands of customers. They began to live in their customers' banks um, to understand how they did their work and how they could, they built their relationships. They integrated their systems to the point where uh, uh, Danny Peltz, Steve's uh, number two, said, we now don't know where our systems begin and their systems. We created such dependency. Right? When, and what that did was that let them move very, very quickly in the marketplace when new opportunities were, they had the relationships going. They made friends before they needed them, uh, in the words of Tip O'Neill and as Bill has mentioned. Um, they were able to roll out innovation after innovation, version after version, of, and triumph in the marketplace. When Steve uh, brought Wells first onto the, uh, onto, 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 online, uh, onto the internet on the commercial side, Wells was doing less than a trillion dollars a year in transactions, about 975 billion, and commanding fees. Off. A decade later, Wells now does 11 trillion dollars a year in transactions online. Their growth has been spectacular. The work that they do on the internet is extremely people intensive. It is people, they have to engage. Uh, Ellis and his team live and travel around the world constantly meeting with customer groups to learn and to stay engaged. So um, uh, uh, collaboration uh, pays. It's hard, hard work. Uh, there are no silver bullets, um, but the engagement then builds these relationships that go on for a very long time, gives you all sorts of competitive advantage. So it's entirely ascribable to that philosophy of, of engagement. Um, and the results um, prove it. Thank you. And last but not least. Hi, I just want to ask a question about um, the role of trust in community engagement and um, community policing and partnership. And um, especially, I'm considering the um, mosque controversy that's been occurring in New York and how do you react to um, people who are trying to engage in community partnership but feel that they aren't trusted, feel that they're being discriminated against even though they're engaging in the community partnerships? The trust issue, that's a great question because it is the absolute essential element of the success of community policing. In the case of Los Angeles, that uh, certainly in its dealings with the, the Los Angeles Police Department, its dealings with the African American community, there was no trust whatsoever. Uh, no trust in the community and the police. And the police, the sense of that community was one that uh, of, uh, uh, lack of trust and respect also, the, 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 the crime that, that, that they were dealing with in that community and uh, the lack of respect that they were getting, not understanding that the lack of respect they were giving was creating a lot of what they were receiving. So the issue of trust, uh, going back to the previous gentleman's question about myself there, I came to be trusted. I was, I was the white outsider. I wasn't even from the LAPD. I was from the East Coast and there's a, there's a prejudice on the West Coast about East Coast and vice versa. And uh, I had to develop trust within the police department. The departments tend to be very closed-minded. They don't like outsiders, no matter what type of reputation you come in with. So it was very <coughs> important to win the trust in the department because it was going to take it in directions that it initially did not want to go. It was not interested in working with the African-American community because what I was dealing with was a department that had been at war with that community. Over seven years, I hired 3,000, 4,000 new police officers, so they were coming into a different environment in which the history of tension was not there for them. And uh, the issue of trust, uh, it, it's, I think it's, uh, in some respects, isn't that what uh, the issue of leadership is about? People tend to, the best, best leaders are those who are trusted rather than, I think, those who are feared. At, uh, and there is a, a, a strong difference. There are many leaders who are, are successful because they have feared, uh, but I think over time that uh, they, they ultimately fail uh, because they just can't keep people in fear forever. Okay. 
Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and we're right, well, time. I think we're out of time. But well, thank you again. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking Bill Bratton and, and Zach Tuman.